Thank you very much, Mr. Gallagher. There's a gray Honda Civic next to the Senior Center with your lights on. If you have a gray Honda Civic next to the Senior Center, your lights are on. That's my announcement for the evening. Are there any town? That's you? Okay. Um, any town meeting members who have yet to be sworn in? Oh, seeing none. Um, Ms. Rowe? Yes, it is, it is moved that if all the business of the meeting is set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Monday, May 23rd, 2011 at 8 p.m. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Man after my own heart. Actually, what we are probably going to do is if we can get through all the articles except for the budgets and the pay as you throw articles and I think article 51 we're going to adjourn till after the override so if we move along tonight we could be gone for a couple of weeks then come back on June 8th so we may be modifying that resolution so let's see what happens um, are there any announcements or resolutions oh, Mr. Tosti Uh, fellow town meeting members, could you all take the finance committee report out? I have a correction. Could you turn to B7? Oh, thank you, Norm. B7. Public Works. B7, B as in boy. Okay, on B7, up at the top, this doesn't affect fiscal 2012, but it affects 2011, um, and it impacts the whole change between 11 and 12. So if you go to the top of page B7, to, uh, it has all public works, personnel services, then it goes to expenses, and then it goes to subtotal. And the subtotal there is 7,802 and change. That number, instead of 7,802, should be 8,222,800. Two two two, eight one five. Again, this is all under fiscal 2011. Then you follow that down to the total, which reads now reads six million seven seven six and change. That number should be seven million one nine five. 729. So instead of 6,776, it's 7,195 to 729. Now you follow that across, and right now it reads an increase of 496,000. That should be an increase of 77,375. for an increase of 1.08% instead of the 732. So again, the increase is 77,375, not 49258. Uh, what happened here was in the 11 budget, it didn't pick up the uh, street lighting in the formula. And so therefore, that appeared much lower than it should have been making the increase to 2012 appear much higher than it really was. 
Now, uh, keep in mind when you're going through the public works budget that um, the real cutback is we lost $230,000 in tip fee stabilization money that goes into this, so automatically they had to cut 230,000 just to stay in the same place. So that's, that's a major factor in that budget. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them at the break or, or well, at the break, because I gotta get home for Leno. But uh, anyway, you would be happy to answer any questions for you. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll make that change administratively. Ms. LaRoya. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Ann LaRoya from Precinct 17. I'm also the chair of the Open Space Committee in town. Um, when some of you arrived tonight, I hope you noticed the display panels in the front lobby. Um, they're illustrating a vision that we have for the Millbrook Linear Park. And the panels will be on view during the break at 9.30. So, um, uh, but I want to give you a brief introduction about them and hope you can take some time to look at them later. The Open Space Committee is appointed by the town manager to prepare and monitor the town's um, official open space and recreation plan. This plan was last approved by the town and the state in 2007. It presents a number of goals and objectives to be met during each five-year term of the plan, but actually last year the state gave Arlington a two-year extension, so the next revision will be in 2014. Uh, one of the goals in the plan is to protect and maintain the waterways and natural open spaces in Arlington. And another goal addresses community education. So the vision for the, a Millbrook Linear Park seeks to incorporate both of these goals and many more things that are in the open space plan and, in fact, revitalize a concept for a Millbrook Corridor Park that has been uh, talked about in town since the 1920s. For example, did you know that Mill Brook travels nearly three miles through the center of Arlington, starts at the reservoir, going all the way down to the lower Mystic Lake? And historically, the brook fed at least seven mill ponds and numerous mill dams that powered the grist mills and other early commercial endeavors that made Arlington a town, starting with uh, Captain George Cook's mill during the, uh, near Mystic Street, which is now, of course, Cook's Hollow. All the mill ponds have been filled over the years, but, and about 40% of the brook is actually hidden from view in underground culverts, but there are still some lovely natural areas that remain, and we're trying to draw some attention to those. Uh, more than 35% of the land within 100 yards of the brook is owned by the town, and the remaining sections include a variety of industrial and commercial properties, um, several important historic sites, and then some, also some residential neighborhoods. Our goal in presenting these uh, preliminary visions for a, a linear park concept, it's all just very conceptual at the moment, um, but is to draw attention to the important historical and natural resources in the town, continue to work with other town committees and departments to enhance the public sections of the brook, focus on improving the water quality and flooding problems that are associated with the brook that many of us know, and also to make these areas more accessible and enjoyable for residents. So let me just mention a couple of the highlights. You'll see them on the uh, display panels outside. Um, and it's important to mention that this, the brook goes through the major part of the um, Arlington, starting at the reservoir to down past the center. And it's bordered um, by Mass Ave on one side, which of course is a commercial strip, and the bike path on the other. So there's some very interesting connections that go all through town over the brook and around it. So it begins at the reservoir behind uh, Drake Village, uh, winds through some wooded areas along herd and reservoir fields, but then it gets forced into a channel around the Colonial Village apartments, which have, of course, been a, a site of major flooding in the past. Uh, it passes under the bikeway behind Sunrise Assisted Living, and then it um, is mostly inaccessible in channels and underground until it comes out um, near the old Schwamm Mill um, at Mill Lane. And uh, you may have known that um, recently the DPW and others uh, re-landscaped and rebuilt the bridge over the Mill Brook there right by old Schwamm Mill. And it's really quite a lovely 
spot um, to, to go and visit. The brook uh, again goes underground and through private property, and then it comes out near Brattle Street. And it enters another really pretty area that um, runs between Brattle and Grove Streets. And then it comes into Wellington Park, where the um, tennis courts are currently being rebuilt and the, doing some improvements to the waterway there. Um, it goes under Grove Street again and past the DPW building. Then it disappears, as I'm sure you probably know, under Pierce Field behind the high school. Comes back up again on the other side of the high school at Mill Brook Road near the old Brigham site and the 22 Mill Street. And this, um, this is another short open stretch that's very accessible and uh, hopefully the, the new developer of the Brigham's um, property there that's building some apartments has promised when working with the Arlington Redevelopment Board to uh, do some enhancements to a, a lovely small pocket park that's there that's really been neglected over the years. So that'll make a really nice uh, entrance to the high school as well as to the, to the new apartments. Then um, the brook continues, uh, it goes under Mill Street and then behind the Mills Brook Square apartments, which are elderly um, housing, I think. Um, then it goes, it disappears again for quite a long stretch under the bikeway and Buzzle Field and uh, the Arlington Catholic Fields. And then it becomes most visible at Cook's Hollow, where it falls about six feet and creates Arlington's only waterfall. Um, the brook then continues in an open channel and open pathway through um, the cemetery and down into Meadowbrook Park, finally falling a few more feet into Mystic, the lower Mystic Lake. So that's, you know, for those of you that live along parts of this, you probably know it, but, you know, a lot of people seem to, you know, are not aware of um, how this important resource that we have. So really this is an educational purpose to draw some attention to the Millbrook Corridor, to start thinking you know, into the future about how we can enhance the, um, the area. And um, so as you're just driving around town or walking, preferably, or biking, just uh, remember to look at the brook when you, when you pass any of the streets like Park Avenue, Forest Street, Brattle, Grove, Mill Street, Mystic Street. They all pass over the brook, but you know we're so busy running around all the time, we hardly see it. So anyway, take a look at the panels and uh, take a look at the brook. Thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements or resolutions? Mr. Chaput. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Roland Chaput, Precinct 12. Uh, just very briefly, uh, I want to let you all know that the Friends of Robbins Farm Park is conducting a fundraiser to replace the slides that are up there. I'm sure most of you have seen those wonderful double slides. They've been there for quite a number of years. Well, this past winter, one of them ended up with a huge hole at the bottom. It became a safety problem. And so it was necessary to take both out because they were, they were hooked together. So if you go up there now, there's just grass in between. We want to replace those slides because they are a real attraction to the town and to the folks who use the park. So, if you are interested in helping us out with a donation of one kind or another, the simple thing is to do, go on the website, friendsofrobinsfarm.org, read the information about it, mail us a check, or use PayPal. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? Any reports or committees? Uh, want to take three off the table, Mr. Tosti? Oh, no, no, she has a report of a committee. Angela, yeah. Never mind. Move that Article 3 be taken from the table. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ms. Lozinski? Angela Olszewski, Precinct 17, and Chair of the Arlington Committee on Tourism and Economic Development. Mr. Moderator, I move that the committee's report be received. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. So received. We're a new committee that was formed by the Board of Selectmen dedicated to encouraging residents and visitors alike to take advantage of all that Arlington has to offer, from dining and shopping to culture and entertainment. 
We plan to promote and market our town as a destination for tourism and a great place to do visits, business. A list of our current activities is provided on the written report that's on the back table. This summer, we plan to promote all the cultural activities that are taking place in town and hope to host a summer concert series similar to the popular one that the Chamber of Commerce used to host. Watch for the launch of our website where all these activities will be listed. We actively support the implementation of the Battle Road Scenic Byway, which also includes the towns of Lexington, Lincoln, and Concord. Um, in the lobby in the back, um, we, have, we have one easel in the back. I know there's a lot of others for the um, Millbrook Corridor, but um, there's right outside the door, you'll find an easel that has a couple of maps that describe the byway. Come visit us at our booth at Town Day, and we look forward to seeing you at the events around town this summer. Thank you very much, Ms. Wozinski. Any other reports or committees? Seeing none, Mr. Tosti, lay three upon the table. on the table. All in favor? That brings us back to Article 24. Uh, Ms. Rowe, you are next. Call the question. On all, on, on, on all, article, all items underneath the article? On, on, uh, under the article. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate on all items underneath Article 24. All in favor? Yes. Opposed? Okay, that's two-thirds. Um, we have before us the substitute motion of Mr. Loretti, which we'll now vote on. All in favor of Mr. Loretti's substitute motion, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. Chairs in doubt. All in favor, please rise. Um, same tellers, please. Ms. Mahan, how many up front? Two in favor up front. Mr. Um, Schlickman? 20 on my left. 18 left center. 26 right center. Mr. McCabe? 15. All opposed, please rise. Up front, Ms. Mahan? Ten. Ten. Oh, there we go. I tilted it. Mr. Schlickman? Eleven. Eleven. Mr. O'Connor? Twenty-three. Twenty-three. Mr. Trembley? Sixteen. Sixteen. Mr. McCabe? Eighteen. Eighteen. It is an affirmative vote, 81 to 76. Well, we're not done yet. We're now going to substitute Mr. Loretti's motion for the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen. All in favor of the sub motion as article as substituted, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. You know, <laughs> I bet it comes out the same. The chair is again in doubt. All in favor, please rise. <laughs> Ms. Mahan, how many up front? One. One. <laughs> Ooh, someone flipped. <laughs> Mr. Schlickman? 22. Mr. O'Connor? 20. Mr. Trembley? 27. Mr. McCabe? 13. All opposed, please say, please rise.
Ms. Mahan? Nine. Nine, up front nine. Mr. Schlickman? Ten. Whoops. Mr. O'Connor? Twenty-two. Twenty-two. Mr. Trembley? Fifteen. Fifteen. And Mr. McCabe? Twenty-three. Twenty-three. It is an affirmative vote, 83 to 79. So it passes. Okay. The I understand the order of things. We have 38 would be next because 31 is still on the table. And that brings us to number th 34 is also on the table. And 35, they're staying on the table. So that brings us to 38. Who's going to introduce it for the selectmen? Oh, Mr. Mr. Sullivan's going to speak on it. Let me get the uh, list. As you may be aware, uh, last year the uh, school committee declared Palmetto School as well as Crosby School. I got Mr. Lavetti, I got Pat. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, as you may be aware, last year, uh, the school committee declared Parmada School as well as the Crosby School as surplus properties on a permanent basis and returned them to the town for disposition. Since then, other town departments have indicated that they too have no use for the properties. Both have not been used for public purposes since the early 80s without uh, further public purpose for these properties in some three decades now. The question arises as to their disposition. This question takes on a greater urgency due to the need for additional funds to help fund the rebuild of the Thompson School, as was described to you Monday night. Article 38 deals with the Palmetto School property, but the principles that uh, I'll discuss here really apply as well to uh, uh, Crosby School on Article 39. As some uh, background information on Palmetto School, the school was built in 1926 and sits at the corner of Academy and Irving Streets. It's an historic structure and an historic district, so that any renovation, reconstruction, or demolition would be subject to the approval of the Pleasant Street Historic District Commission. As I mentioned, the building has not served as a public building since at least 1983 and is currently being rented as a private educational space by two tenants Arlington Children's Center into the International School of Boston. The current lease on the property expires June 30th, 2013. The building contains uh, 27,616 square feet of space and sits on 52,781 square feet of land made up of several contiguous parcels. The parcel right at the corner of Academy in Irving, uh, which contains approximately 21,780 square feet is used as a public playground. The property is located in the R1 single family zoning district where the predominant use is single family. Town meeting has already expressed its preference for continued private edu educational use of this property so that is what is being proposed uh, in the motion tonight. Now whether this uh, property is sold or leased, the proposal is to continue the current lease, as I said, as private educational use, giving preference to the current tenants, and to retain the front area being used as a public playground. The minimum sale price has been set at $1.7 million. By way of information, the assessed value of the property without the playground area is approximately $2.5 million. An earlier study done by, by uh, RKG Associates put the estimated value at just over $1.3 million 
Well, this likely uh, underestimates uh, the true value given that they had used a capitalization rate of uh, 12%, which seemed uh, excessively high. In any event, the final sale price would ultimately be determined based upon the appraisals that are done on the property and the actual bids received. Generally, it would make sense for the town to sell the property where there is no longer any public use for the property. Uh, final determination of benefits of sale versus lease, however, cannot be made until we actually go through a bid process. The bid process would involve obtaining an appraisal, as I mentioned earlier, issuing uh, requests for proposals, and we do that for both sale and lease, and doing a side-by-side -side comparison of the proposals so we can see the advantages and disadvantages of both sale and lease. As we all already know, owning and maintaining a property, particularly a property that's of a significant age as this one is, can be a very costly proposition. I feel strongly that the financial exposure and the risk has of continued ownership of these properties requires that we give serious consideration to their sale. Some of the uh, ownership concerns uh, that I have include uh, the following. Uh, given that the property is over 85 years old and has a great deal of deferred maintenance on the property, the true cost of maintaining and managing the property exceeds or at best equals the lease income that we're bringing into the property and it represents really a growing liability for the town. Uh, secondly, the town is not in a position to assume this risk and financial exposure of being a commercial landlord for this property. And the town really should not be in the business of being a commercial real estate property uh, manager. We don't have the expertise, we don't have the resources to deal with this, and it really takes away from the true core mission of the community. And just uh, by way of examples, uh, the Sims Project, I guess, is a good example of the risk of being in the commercial real estate business without the expertise and resources to properly manage it. The Palmer and Crosby leases themselves are another example of this. It was not until I raised the issue a few years ago with the Redevelopment Board about the uh, low rents uh, that they really focused on it and ended up raising those rents uh, fairly significantly. And that's not a criticism of ARB, but this is really not their core mission, um, and it really wasn't something that they were focused on. Uh, with respect to the annual cost of owning and maintaining a building, uh, it's universally accepted that building and its various components depreciate every year to determine the true cost, accurate cost, of uh, the maintenance of the building and the uh, capital replacement is really to do a life cycle cost analysis or a building condition analysis of the property. Uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, costly thing, but you'd actually go through each of the components of the building, like the roofing, uh, the electrical system, plumbing system, and so forth. You determine the condition of it, the uh, remaining useful life of it, and then calculate the useful life of the building, and then calculate actual annual costs of maintaining it at that point, and also the built-up deferred maintenance liability for that property. But that's a costly proposition to do that. So what many uh, organizations do uh, is actually use a set percentage of replacement value based upon useful life of the building to determine what the annual maintenance cost or capital replacement cost of uh, the property is. And generally this would put, you know, if it's a 50 year estimated life for the property, this would put the annual capital replacement cost or liability at about 2% of the current replacement value, value of the building. A lot of the institutions use as low as 1%, some use as high as 4%, but I think generally most use in the neighborhood about 2% of replacement value as your real true cost of owning and maintaining that building. And if you add to this the cost of uh, property management expenses along with other uh, costs, and you compare that against our current lease rates, I believe the town's barely breaking even on the proposition, and when you factor in the deferred maintenance, I think it's really a losing proposition for the town. I'd say that the current tenants would certainly uh, prefer to have a long-term lease to ensure the stability there and not to take on uh, the risk of ownership, but uh, given the fact that we're taking that risk, I would prefer that we actually go out and take a look at sale versus lease and make sure what is the best option for the town. I think it's, you know, for this reason, when we look at any future lease, if we're going to continue to lease it, I want to make sure that we have a provision in the lease that uh, they would be responsible for any capital replacement, that we'd actually establish a fund 
where they'd put money aside uh, for future capital repairs rather than the town taking on that liability. Um, a few have suggested to us during this process that we can increase current rents significantly and have the tenants fund this capital renewal fund. Under this scenario, I believe that it's unlikely that the tenants would want to invest in capital improvements to buildings they do not own. And in the case of buildings with significant age, the risk are even higher. We would still explore this option, uh, but I'm not optimistic that the tenants would find this attractive. In any event, having the option of selling the property will put the town, I believe, in the best position to obtain the most financially advantageous result, whether it be sale or lease, and maximize the funding assistance for the Thompson School. In addition, the conditions uh, that's proposed or placed upon any potential sale, I think contain appropriate protections for both the town and the neighborhood. Uh, so I'd urge you to support the uh, motion before you to allow us to explore both sale and lease options and determine what is in the best interest in the town uh, for the long run. Thank you. Yes, sir. I think Mrs. Rowe is about to answer it, but uh, are, are, we, are we debating the, uh, what's in the selectman's report or the, the vote on the back of the map? I think Ms. Rowe is going to get up and introduce the substitute. Oh, okay. But Ms., Ms., Mr. Sullivan seemed to be speaking to the motion that wasn't yet pro properly right. before us. Thank you. I think. Ms. Rowe. Thank you. Um, I am putting forward uh, the substitute motion that's been on your seats for a while. It's the one on the back of the map. Um, and it says that the Board of Selectmen be and hereby is authorized to dispose of the Parmer School and its impertinent land by sale, lease, or otherwise, provided that any sale of the property shall not be less than $1,700,000, shall include a right of re first refusal in favor of the town and in, in the event the property is offered for resale shall restrict future use of the property to educational use and shall exclude approximately 21,870 square feet of land currently in use as a public playground. Um, I think this is self-evident. This is something that we thought about for a while. We had always thought of having the first um, refusal come back to the town if the land was ever for sale again. Um, I have a detailed map of the parcels that have been um, acquired over time. If anybody wants to look at them at the break, um, we have one, two, three, four, five, six different parcels taken by eminent domain um, at different times and gift. So I can certainly show that to you. And um, I'm looking for a second for the motion. Thank you. Seconded. Mr. Mrs. Warden. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Patricia Warden, Precinct 8. During my final year in the school committee, we decided to renovate and upgrade all our elementary schools to bring them into the computer age and get them ready for the 21st century. So now, almost 20 years later, we've reached that point, thanks to a great deal of hard work by many in bringing our vision forward, surely but steadily. Thank you, town meeting, for your vote on Thompson School, and thanks to the Permanent Town Building Committee and the Capital Budget Committee and many others. Now, we must select the best option and lowest risk for funding the Thompson School rebuild from Parmenter and Crosby. So, fellow town meeting members, please vote no on articles 38 and 39. And O. Oh, here are five main points about these schools. One, Parmenter and Crosby are pots of gold at the end of the rainbow, which have been selected as town assets to be a revenue source for rebuilding another town asset, the Thompson School. To persuade us to allow the schools to be sold rather than rented, the administration presented some smoke and mirror arguments and somewhat imaginary facts tonight, which simply 
do not have the authenticity of, for example, the figures carefully researched over the years by the Arlington Redevelopment Board for capital costs and other projections. I have familiarity with these buildings, both as a former school committee member and as a resident in a house older than Parmenter, and I find the administration's figures to have little relevance to reality. The RKG report, which was distributed to you on the listserv two weeks ago, describes on pages six through eight, preferability of rental market rates rather than sale. Rental would provide long-term revenue sufficient to support four to five million dollars of debt obligations for the Thompson School rebuild. The current lease situation is good for the town and would be even better at market rates. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Town meeting should be very careful not to sell these buildings and give them away at a pittance. Years ago, when Cutter School was closed by the school committee, a financial windfall was expected by the town from its sale. It didn't happen. Someone else got the windfall. Second point, when the administration decides that dollars are needed or some other project, how will they go about selecting the next capital asset to be used as the pot of gold? Is there any comprehensive, open communication between the Selectmen, Redevelopment Board, Park and Recreation Commission, School Committee and Chamber of Commerce about such assets? Where is the transparency in such considerations, many of which need our vote as town meeting members? How can we be sure that informational reports given to us by the administration are complete, or in fact, if they have had important information removed, as happened with the RKG report version, given us last year, which was missing important information on rental data. Essentially then, what will be the domino effect of these articles on all our town properties and assets? The third point is quality of life issues, which could be very negative for various Arlington residents if these buildings are sold without long-term deed restrictions. Parents of Arlington Children's Centre and of the other schools are enthusiastic about them. The open space around the schools is very important for recreation in both these neighbourhoods. The articles on which we are being asked to vote do not spell out precisely the amounts or dimensions and boundaries of the land involved. It would be irresponsible for us as town meeting members to vote to enable the sale of a pertinent land without knowing exactly in the vote specifications what we're actually voting on <coughs> and what protections are to be provided by means of deed restrictions that has not been defined in writing. Without that, the selectmen's assurances are simply wishful thinking and do not have the force of law. We would be voting on a pig in the poke. Some of the land is protected as open space and recreation and cannot be sold without permission and votes of various bodies, including the Park and Recreation Commission and the Massachusetts Legislature. Point number four addresses the town's desirable core function. In today's, work of two, in today's world of two working parents, childcare accessibility should be considered a core municipal function, not necessarily one which the town can fund operationally, but most certainly one which we can facilitate to the maximum extent possible, just as we do with the senior center and senior services, or for example, the extended day kindergarten, both of which are housed in school buildings or former school buildings, and both of which are obviously now core municipal functions. When the school committee voted to release Cosby and Parmenter schools to the redevelopment board, I was delighted that the board rented them to these respective private schools. Good childcare and varied educational programs are very important to Arlington's overall continuum of educational services. The only fault one can find with the current arrangement is that too often parents find that their child cannot be accommodated in Arlington Children's Centre because it is so popular. There are rarely vacancies for, for late applicants. I do hope that the chairman of the Board of Selectmen, who was so eloquent in persuading town meeting members to vote for wide geographical distribution in Arlington of numerous liquor stores so that we can all conveniently purchase our liquor in any region of town, that she will be equally eloquent about protecting, with a deed restriction for these schools if sold, the advantages of convenient access to good childcare for those who need it. The selectmen need to rationalize and codify their priorities. What are the core municipal functions? Why, for example, according to information I have received, does Mystic River Watershed Association have rent-free accommodation in the central school, whereas the town manager has been allowed to endanger 
continuance of our excellent schools and daycare centre in Crosby and Parmentier, even though these schools pay good rent to the town and provide building maintenance. My final point addresses risk to the town. This is of great importance for your consideration. The low-risk options of greatest value are to continue rentals. The RKG report corroborates this. If you give selectmen the power to sell these buildings, you risk creating a Sims-type scenario at either Parmenter or Crosby. Even the argument used tonight that the town, used for this whole situation, that the town needs your vote to optimize negotiations was repeatedly used for various dubious maneuvers for Sims to get town meetings yes vote, resulting in increasing misfortune for the town. I've seen it all up close and personal, having served during the Sims saga in various committees as a member of the Housing Authority. Attempts to sell these school buildings could be a reenactment of bait and switch activities, failed promises, unadulterated greed, overriding of all interests of historic preservation, overriding of promises of recreational facilities, overriding of maintenance of a once attractive neighborhood. The administration is not without blame in all of that. There are numerous instances of the roads not taken along the way in that development, which could have given us a modest development at Sims and honored some of the promises that were made by the Board of Selectmen. Instead of that, we have perpetrated literally a dump in the Sims neighborhood. The town actually allowed the site to be used as a dump for other towns, for the excess snow, tainted with roadway pollution, which eventually would drain into our mill brook. Sims neighbors deserve special treatment from the town to compensate for the depressing scenario and litigation they have suffered. And we should make sure that we do not enable perpetration of such a disaster in the Crosby and Parmenter neighborhoods. Those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. Let the administration focus on turning Sims around. In conclusion, if we do give the administration the power to sell these schools without adequate deed restrictions and the risk factors are as high as expected, then, dear fellow town meeting members, for the ensuing disaster will lie not in the stars but in ourselves. The administration already has all the power it needs to raise funding from Crosby and Parmenter by renting. They do not need and should not have a yes vote on these articles. Please vote no on the final votes on Articles 38 and 39, whether substituted or not. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gordon. Mr. McCabe. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Harry McCabe, Precinct 21. Uh, with all due respect to the presentation made by the manager, I have a question for the town council, and then I would like to further address the question. What is the question, sir? Uh, my understanding of the town charter, the town manager act, is that uh, the, the manager is the custodian of all town properties. And my understanding of the Charter, the Town Manager Act, etc., is that only the manager may dispose of town properties subject to the uh, approval of the town meeting. Uh, would, the, would the council clarify that for me? Ms. Rice, can you address this question? might need one second to find the specific reference, Mr. McCabe. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Juliana Rice, Town Council. Um, I, I have to disagree respectfully with Mr. McCabe. The town manager has jurisdiction over the rental and use of all town property, except for schools. Um, but disposition of property is governed by state law, Chapter 40, Section 3, uh, which allows the Board of Selectmen to dispose of property if duly authorized by this town meeting. Thank you very much. Mr. Moderator, I don't believe this, this is a good idea. Uh, I know a lot of hard work has gone into it, but it seems to me that it's taking us in the wrong direction. Uh, we should be uh, conserving uh, our town property, uh, not disposing of it. Uh, 
the town is uh, land poor. Uh, if we needed a piece of land for a fire station, for a school, for a cemetery, for a playground, uh, what do we do? Uh, we know we're not going to take private property. It's too expensive and it's politically unwise. What are we going to do next year? Are we going to start selling off our wall fields, our playgrounds? It doesn't make sense. It, it, it just seems to me that we're panicking. I, I understand uh, the uh, town uh, is uh, experiencing uh, financial uh, hardship, but uh, I don't think that uh, things are so bad off that we have to start uh, selling uh, town properties. Now, with respect to the Thompson School question, I voted in favor of it, and I would vote in favor of it in favor of it again if it came before us. And I don't recall that there was any language in the vote that conditioned the uh, construction of the new Thompson School on the sale of these two properties, 38 and 39, Article 38, Article 39. Uh, and if, if there was a condition in that vote, I didn't see it. Uh, I know we've talked about uh, how the monies uh, derived from these sales could be applied to the Thompson School, but to the Thompson School project. But uh, I think uh, that was a little Machiavellian in my opinion. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, we, can, we can do better than that. Um, we should be thinking about what we want the town to look like next year, five years from now, 10, 20, 30. And who knows? what the future is going to bring in terms of uh, need for a piece of land for the town for a project. Uh, we don't know, but we do know this, that if we dispose of these properties, it's forever. They're not going to come back. Uh, I understand that in the proposed vote, uh, there's uh, couple of caveats about uh, uh, restricting the use and uh, uh, town's right of first refusal, etc. But uh, my understanding is that these uh, restrictions are, uh, are not forever. That uh, from what the town council has told me, uh, uh, they would expire after a period of years. Uh, I don't remember the number she gave me. She could probably tell us that again. But again, uh, I think there are other ways, I believe, to uh, get us through uh, this uh, financial difficulty that the town's experiencing. Uh, one of the ways, in my opinion, is that we should be talking to the judge about whether or not uh, restricting our budget to uh, two and a half percent of last year's budget is really uh, legal, number one, and appropriate. Arlington is one of two towns in the Commonwealth. There are 351 cities and towns, but Arlington is one of two in the Commonwealth that operates under this uh, stranglehold on our budget. As I recall, Proposition Two and a Half, and I was the moderator when it was passed, the town is restricted to two and a half yeah. percent 
of the total fair market value of all real and personal property in the town. Mr. McCabe? Over oh, here. Does that, uh, please stay within the scope of the article. We're talking about the sale of Parmenter. It is because I believe that there are other options and I am suggesting one. Well, okay. May I continue? Yeah, okay. let's kind of rein it in a little though. If you look at the uh, town report that we received this year and use your simple fourth grade mathematics, two and a half percent of the total value of all real personal property in the town is approximately $172 million. Why are we limiting ourselves to $114 million? Why is Arlington forced to exist under this restriction? Have we been bad? Have we done something wrong? Ms. Rice uh, can answer I, that I question don't, if you I don't wish. think so. I think uh, the, the United States Constitution, as I understand it, says that yeah. we're entitled to Ms. Rice, can you tell equal, me why? equal treatment under the law. Why is Arlington and one other town in the Commonwealth treated so differently? Do you want an answer? Ms. Rice can tell you why. Uh, you, you may answer on your time, sir. Okay. Go ahead, keep going, got two minutes left. Thank you. So the point I'm trying to make is that if we are, as I think, panicking, and, and I'm beginning to think we are, then I think it's time that we gotta start thinking outside the box. Uh, this business of just turning the crank every year, it's not working for Arlington. It works for 349 other cities and towns in the Commonwealth, but it's not working for Arlington, and it's not working for another town in the Commonwealth. I think it's East Ham down the Cape, although I'm not sure, don't quote me on that. So I think it's time to see the judge. I think it's time to take this whole question of the noose that's around our neck into court and find out why a bureaucrat at the state level has the right to dictate to us how much we may appropriate within the limits of $172 million. I always understood that we were a nation of laws, not of men. Yet, a man, the Commissioner of Corporation and Taxation at the State House, made that decision some 20 or 30 years ago, and we've been suffering with it ever since and it's not right. In my opinion, it's not legal. I recommend very strongly that you vote no on these articles. It will not injure the uh, Thompson Project because the vote that we made did not condition the construction of the new school to the sale of these two properties. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Warden. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Worden, Precinct 8. <coughs> when, I, when I first saw Mrs. Rose's substitute motion, and that's the one she brought forward <coughs> tonight, but we've all had it yeah, for a while, <coughs> um, it, seemed, uh, it, it seemed as though things were moving in the right direction. Uh, they had accepted, uh, that is the selectmen had accepted Mr. Loretti's idea of setting minimum prices uh, they had accepted Mr. Rarig's uh, idea of removing from consideration the portions that are supposed to be parkland, and they, they had accepted my idea of providing some level of protection for the neighborhoods against unfortunate developments in the future. <coughs> then, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I watched the tape of the Board of Selectmen meeting at which these uh, uh, revised uh, uh, votes, recommended votes, were approved for presentation uh, to you, the town meeting. And Ms. Rice uh, was good enough to explain uh, that a restriction contained in a recorded deed could be in effect for 30 years, 
but if they operated under a land disposition agreement, or LDA, it could be much more flexible. For example, suppose the property were sold to a school and the school people came around in five years to the Board of Selectmen and said, we've had an offer we can't refuse from a 40B developer who will pay us three times what we paid, so would you please back off your restriction so we can take all that money and build a new school elsewhere? There are currently <coughs> two pro 40B members on the Board of Selectmen. It would only take one more to sell the neighborhood down the drain. As you probably know, a 40B developer can ignore all our zoning protections and exploit the land to the max with no regard for the damage to the neighborhood. And that, that includes, in the case of Parmenter, of course, they can blow by the protections that Mr. Sullivan so correctly described with respect to the historic district. Uh, the right of first refusal mentioned in the vote is essentially useless since I can't imagine the town coming up with the money to match such an offer. And Ms. Rice did not mention that even a recorded restriction is not automatically for 30 years. It can be any period of time up to 30 years that is selected by the seller or negotiated by the parties. The seller, in this case the town, could, uh, or the selectman, could select a short, shorter period, such as three, five, or 10 years, which would essentially uh, be uh, just lip service and essentially worthless in this type of transaction. That's why I would like to specify the maximum period allowed by law. Uh, and uh, in that, um, for that reason, um, I would like to move to amend the uh, recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen and I will hand that up now. Um, I think this is this is this this is on the um, uh, on the screen and. There were copies at the back of the hall both uh, uh, tonight and, um, <coughs> and um, uh, Monday night. Uh, and I did post it to the, um, to the uh, town meeting listserv. Uh, whether that got through, was accessible to everybody, I, 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 I don't know. Um, <coughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll, uh, but I will, uh, I will read it just in case anybody didn't, wasn't able to, uh, to get it from one of those sources. I hereby submit the following amendment to substitute motion of the Board of Selectmen. Insert after the figure uh, 1.7 million in the fourth line the following words, and shall be conveyed by deed, which, and after the word use in the sixth line the following words, for at least 30 years. And the motion, uh, as so amended, would read as follows. That the Board of Selectmen be in hereby is authorized to dispose of the Parmenter School and its pertinent land by sale, lease, or otherwise, provided that any sale of the property shall be for not less than $1,700,000 and shall be conveyed by a deed which shall include a right of first refusal in favor of the town, the event the property is offered for resale, and shall restrict future use of the property for educational use, to educational use, for at least 30 years, and shall exclude approximately 21870 square feet of land currently in use as public playground. <clears throat> Although I agree with the previous two speakers that we should not sell these valuable town assets, uh, which, which does require ultimately a two-thirds vote by the town meeting, if we do decide to empower the selectmen to sell, one, uh, to sell then we owe it to the neighborhoods in which the schools, and I'm, I will be speaking really of both schools, are located to protect them from any in inappropriate development in the future, or at least for 30 years, by restricting the use to educational by a recorded deed, not by a wishy-washy land disposition agreement. Perhaps <coughs> after 30 years, 40B will have been repealed, or Arlington will have passed the 10% affordable level, so that it will not then be a threat. <coughs> now, do we really need this tightening up of the Board of Selectmen's motion? Do you remember the Sims Hospital fiasco? In order to persuade the townspeople to vote for the 
$14 million debt exclusion, again, to protect us from the threat of 40B, the Board of Selectmen made a number of commitments. And here are some excerpts I happen to have <coughs> from 10 years ago. Arlington Board of Selectmen official policy statement. Okay. The town commits to a balanced mixed-use redevelopment of predominantly general office and some medical uses with a limited residential component that includes affordable housing. The town commits to a redevelopment that is at least self-supporting, generating income after a three to four year startup period sufficient to offset the costs of acquisition, renovation, and maintenance. The town commits to promoting expanded health care services on the site. Now that sounds great, doesn't it? And we were convinced. But what do we have 10 years later? Two perfectly good buildings, which any developer with any imagination would have converted to new uses, were destroyed. And we have a dust bowl in the summer and a snow dump in the winter. Completely unfair to the people who live in that neighborhood. For these schools, we need something more binding than the commitments of the Board of Selectmen. So the purpose of my amendment, something we owe to the residents of the Parmenter and Crosby neighborhoods, is to ensure that in the event of any subsequent sale of these properties, they will be limited to educational use because that would be right there in the recorded deed. I can't see why anyone who cares about our neighborhoods would object to my amendment. All it does is to require that any subsequent use of these parcels would be substantially what they are now, educational uses. Even if there were to be new construction on the land, it would have to be for educational uses and in accordance with our zoning bylaws and in the case of Parmenter, our historic district protections. So, if you're in favor of selling the Parmenter and Crosby schools, please vote for my amendment to give the neighborhoods the protections they deserve. If you're against selling, as I am, please vote yes. Uh, please vote yes for my amendment in case the other side wins. <coughs> At, at least in that case, the neighborhoods will have some level of protection. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Loretti? Um, I rise in opposition to this article because I'm not prepared at this time to give the Board of the Selectmen the authority to sell the Parmenter School. Um, before I begin with presenting a few slides, I'd like to ask a few questions, though. And the first is, if this article does not pass, can the Selectmen sign a long-term lease for the Parmenter School? Ms. Rice? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Juliana Rice, Town Council. Last year, town meeting voted to transfer care, custody, management, and control of the former Parmenter School and all the pertinent land to the Board of Selectmen for the purpose of managing the property, including but not limiting to continuing or extending the current lease arrangement while exploring options for the property's future use. I'm sorry, was that a yes or a no? Could they lease it for long term under that? Last year's town meeting voted to authorize the Board of Selectmen to manage the property, including continuing or extending the current lease arrangement. Okay, I'm gonna take that as a yes, thank you very much. I'd, I'd like to explore this question that um, uh, Mr. McCabe raised in regard to the linkage of the sale of this school and indeed the Crosby School to the Thompson rebuild. And in particular, um, the slides presented on Monday indicated that the available non-exempt debt for the school rebuild program is $12.7 million, yet the Thompson plan is to use $6.7 million right now. I would like to know whether that additional $6 million of non-exempt debt that has already been authorized by the voters could be used uh, in lieu of selling this building. Someone on the Finance Committee want to address that? Or the Treasurer? Ben? Uh, 
Charles Foskett, uh, Precinct 8, um, member of the Finance Committee. The um, former uh, town council explored this issue with the Department of Revenue about um, seven years ago, I think. And the Department of Revenue ruled that uh, there is no limit on how much of the um, town's available debt exclusion can be used. In other words, the, uh, the town does not have to officially live within the uh, commitment to get reimbursement from the state. If the town wanted to spend the full $34 million that was voted um, in the um, debt exclusion vote of April 2000, uh, it could spend the entire $34 million. Of course, that entire $34 million would go on the tax rate. Uh, the reason that this was uh, presented in the fashion that it was presented with the um, state reimbursement being applied to the um, available uh, unused debt exclusion amount is because the voters were told in 2000 uh, that um, they would be spending somewhere between 37 cents and uh, 50 cents on the dollar. So the town has lived since that time within that commitment. If we were to apply the full amount of the available debt exclusion to the Thompson project, uh, the, um, the amount that was shown on a, uh, in a per parcel basis would essentially, uh, would essentially double. So uh, in the financing proposal that was presented to you the other night, uh, every attempt was made to stay within the uh, original commitment to the voters as to how much their taxes would be increased um, by this project. Okay, thank you. Um, I calculated that between both the Parmenter and Crosby School, if indeed the $3 million between the two schools uh, was to go on the tax rate, it would add a total of $15 per year over about 20 years. Uh, as opposed to the current $30 per year that was in the material that was given out on Monday. And indeed, actually, one of the tables they showed there seems to indicate that one of the scenarios was indeed to put that $3 million with the exempt debt. There's a, uh, well, I won't get into it now, but I, I would just make the point that we do not have to sell the Parmenter School or the Crosby School to rebuild the Thompson School and that the impact on the um, tax rate is very, very small. Um, my next question, and Mr. Good, if you could bring up the aerial photograph that was shown previously. Um, I'd like to know whether there, any of the land that is to be disposed of is Article 97 land under the um, uh, Massachusetts Constitution. Mr. Roderator, Juliana Rice Town Council, none of the land on the Parmenter site is Article 97 protected. Thank you. Will any of the original parcel that the school was um, situated on be sold? I'm, I'm sorry, will any of it be kept from the, by the town and not sold? I think so. Uh, if the question is the parcel on which the original school sat, which is indicated by the plan to retain on the corner of Academy and Irving. Um, most of that parcel, except the part on which the kindergarten addition, which is uh, parallel to Irving Street, encroaches, um, the rest of that would be carved out and retained um, in its current use as recreational space. Thank you. I, I think there's some real issues here um, in zoning. If you have a lot that's already undersized, as this one is, you cannot um, carve out part of that or sell part of that property to someone else because you have a non-conforming lot that you're making more non-conforming. Um, and Mr. Good, if we could have the slides now, I'd appreciate it. I'm not going to read through every one of these, but um, I would ask you to look at item C. Have we looked at all the current and foreseeable public uses of the property? Last year, when these uh, buildings were turned over to the selectmen, the commitment was that they would do a th thorough study of the most beneficial uses over the coming year, which means the, the past year. We haven't seen them. And, and I, I, that alone uh, is sufficient reason for me not to vote for this article. I think we need to know what they are first. Also, the town manager talked about these being private entities that are using, uh, the, renting the school. They are, but they very much serve a public purpose, and I think we need to consider that. Um, if you can move to the next slide. On 
under B, it talks about the financial impact to the town. And if you look at page D1 of your finance committee report, it gives the local receipts uh, over the next five years. That amount's gonna go down by $300,000 a year if we sell these schools. The rental income from the two schools is substantial. It's being used right now to help fund the town. Particularly if we don't have an override or a successful override, we're really gonna need that money. And if you look at the analysis or the, um, this year's report to town meeting by the selectmen, they um, talk about um, you know, doing this analysis of the best uses in the future. Again, I think that needs to be done now before we actually vote on this. If you could have the next slide, please. And I'm gonna, the next one. Yeah, I, I wanted to uh, address the point of the town manager about the uh, potential to increase the uh, rent in this school. And I have a very different recollection of what happened when the redevelopment board uh, last signed the leases back in 2009. In fact, what had happened is staff had presented us with the proposal for very modest rental increases. The redevelopment board asked for a uh, market study to be done, and we found that the rents were substantially below market rate. We were able to negotiate rental increases the first year of, of over 50%, or around 50%, and in subsequent years, significant increases as well. We did not need the authorization to sell the school at that time to get those uh, increases in place. That's always an option, and it's always there on the table. You don't ha the selectmen don't need it, and we don't need it. Now, unfortunately, if you look at what happened in 2012 and 2013, the selectmen chose not to um, continue that trend. I calculate that between the Crosby School and the Parmenter School, the town probably lost about $50,000 by not um, keeping that trend over the, the past couple of years. So if we could have the last slide, the next slide, please. No, one back. In summary, I'd say the town is not ready to authorize the sale. Selling is a risky proposition um, because of the zoning issues. And I think the town really ought to be realizing long-term value and not short-term cash. Uh, there's still potential to raise the rents in this building. And we have the capacity in the debt exclusion that's already been authorized. Let's use it. Let's get the Thompson School rebuilt. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Mr. Stickman. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. I'm here to offer one more nightmare scenario. I'm not going to come and speak in favor or opposed to this motion per se at this point, but I would like to illustrate some possibilities that are open under the terms of the present motion with the hopes that if somebody can come up to the podium and uh, come up with a solid uh, argument that this would not be possible, then I might be able to vote for it. But I'd first like to uh, direct your attention to page C1 in the Finance Committee report. Mm -hmm. And if you take a look at page C1 down in the lower left-hand corner, uh, you will see way down the bottom tuition assessments, charter school sending tuition in the amount of $252,662. According to the State Department of Education, this is the assessment for 20 students. This is an average assessment which is deducted immediately off the top of our chapter 70, we have no choice, of $12,633 per pupil. Now, a charter school is an educational use, but it could be a very costly educational use to the town of Arlington. And if one of the current occupants buys the building and either sells it to a charter school or leases it to a charter school that is housed in Arlington and is attracting students from Arlington, if it attracts 100 students, which is not that many, 
it's $1.26 million per year, almost the total amount that we would receive in payment for the Crosby School. If we had a few more children, 135 going to a charter school in Arlington, that would be $1.7 million, the total amount we would be receiving for the Parmenter School. An educational use. We have a State Board of Education that has uh, had an aggressive policy in authorizing Commonwealth charter schools. We have 20 people going to Commonwealth charter schools outside of Arlington and some at a considerable distance. Given the deterioration of services to school children in the town of Arlington over the past 10 years, lack of library services, increased class size, increased user fees. A charter school receiving $12,000 per pupil can afford to provide a premium service, extended day, and no user fees in comparison to what we can afford to do. That's a bargain. Totally free to the parent. $12,633 per pupil. If you multiply that by the 4,713 students we have according to the Department of Education, that's 59 million, almost $60 million. As it stands now, we're looking to appropriate $38 million with an additional $6.8 million expected in Chapter 70 state aid of 45 million, minus, of course, the $250,000 of state aid that is being directed over to the charter schools for fiscal 12. Unless I am convinced that this educational purpose would not allow somebody who buys this to transfer ownership or lease to a charter school, we could end up losing more money in one year on an end be liable for that amount year after year after year than we would collect in the total sale of this property. So that is my concern. That's what makes me anxious about the wording of the vote. That's what makes me anxious about keeping this as an educational use. That's why I hope we can take a look at this and ensure that a property that retains educational use doesn't get into a situation where it could be hugely costly for our town. Thank you. Mr. Foskett. Charles uh, Machiavelli Foskett. <laughs> Precinct 8. <clears throat> I would uh, like to point out in the presentation that we gave the other night on page 11, uh, the frequently asked questions, it uh, mentions that the uh, disposition of the Crosby and Parma to schools are entirely up to the, um, to the town meeting and um, what happens if uh, you select uh, not to vote in favor of them. And on page six of that report, it also points out that the MSBA wants a full unrestricted vote without any uh, contingencies such as MSBA re uh, reimbursement or the sale of the Parmenter or Crosby uh, buildings. So I just want to clear the air that there was no um, misrepresentations in that presentation. There were none. This is a complex and sensitive issue. And, um, do you mind? Yeah. Okay. and um, I recognize that um, there are many different viewpoints on this. Mr. Schlickman just gave us one. He neglected to point out that, and, and I'm not speaking here in, front, in favor of charter schools, but he neglected to point out that 
Uh, in principle, if a student goes to a charter school and we have to pay for that cost, we don't have to pay for the cost in the educational system. It may not be a one-for-one -one equivalency, but um, uh, I, I think his argument was a little bit distorted. Um, in this presentation, I'm fundamentally going to focus on minimizing risk to the town while reallocating resources for future use. Now, on uh, slide two behind me here is the, present, is the slide that you saw yesterday, um, or Monday, I'm sorry, with respect to uh, an approach to funding the Thompson. And we suggested that approximately $3 million could be gained by the sale or long-term lease of the Crosby and Parmenter schools. Um, as has been reported by the town manager, they are no longer, longer directly used by the town. They're rented to third parties and they have been for about 20 years. The, um, I, I would like to suggest that uh, there are some core missions that are part of the town's uh, charter, if you will, and they include ensuring the public safety, uh, maintaining public works and infrastructure, educating children, and providing for uh, other needed social services. Managing real estate for third parties is a permitted activity for a municipality. But I'm suggesting to you that this is not a core part of our mission, and educating our children is a core part of our mission. Now the basic issue, the basic reason why the manager and the Board of Selectmen are, are trying to take these assets and convert them into other assets is because of the cost of ownership. The mantle of ownership assumes, uh, includes assuming the cost of maintenance and reinvestment to avoid the risk of building decay and collapse into gr gross unfitness for the original purpose. This is a basic concept that's embodied in the idea of depreciation. And if we own the Crosby and Parmenter buildings, like any other asset owner, we ultimately assume this risk. Let's think about how old these buildings are. The Parmenter is 85 years old. There's a report, uh, there's an, this uh, slide number six has a, uh, uh, an excerpt from the back of the capital planning report on the age of various buildings. The Parmenter School is, is now 85 years old. The Crosby School is 116 years old. These buildings are at risk for causing, costing us a great deal of money. And as we know from our school rebuilding, money, uh, re school rebuilding program, this can be large. The next slide uh, just shows graphically the cost of uh, our, our school rebuilding program over the last dozen years or so. It's a very strong tribute to the citizens of Arlington who have voted and to this town meeting who voted on Monday night to, to rebuild the Thompson that we have undertaken this program that is approaching in a dozen years $100 million in cost. Combined with our efforts in fire stations, parks, playgrounds, and um, our library and our town hall, this posture suggests that we have in this town a citizenry that has embraced the civic virtue that will, it will pass to the next generation Future, uh, the, the future value that its predecessors have passed to it, to it in the past. But as you can see from this chart, this civic virtue doesn't come without cost. We've had cost in other, in other town buildings. For example, you don't have to pick that up, David. That's okay. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Pat. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Too much. <laughs> Um, the other buildings have recently cost us a fair amount of money as well. For example, the Park Circle Fire Station at $3.8 million. Community safety, we're looking at spending $8 million over several years. We've just spent last year a million and a quarter dollars on fixing the decaying outside of the central fire station. We still have to do the inside. Now, it's, uh, there, there's a, there are a number of data reports on the cost of building reconstruction and building replacement that are available in public databases. One such report reports that in the Boston area, commercial uh, one-story single simple office building has a replacement cost of $190 a square foot. And our area is substantially more expensive than places like Portland, Oregon, Oregon or Phoenix, Arizona. So um, the, this replacement cost is something that we have to consider in how, on what our future exposure is with respect to the Parmenter and the Crosby schools. 
Now, one view of, one way to estimate the cost or the value of a building is to just take the current rents, uh, um, uh, plug those values into a traditional, um, traditional um, mortgage calculation, and we can estimate that these uh, two buildings together have a value of somewhere around four to four and a half million dollars at this time. Um, there is a, a, a more sophisticated uh, way of looking at maintenance costs. Uh, the manager referred to these earlier, and, um, and basically the, the maintenance and replacement costs are between one and a half and two and a half or three percent of the replacement value of the buildings. One of the formulas that are used in these various analyses is something called the sherman Durgis formula. And incidentally, if you apply that to the Crosby School, the, the maintenance value is not 2%, but 6%. So you, that just gives you an example of what our exposure might be. So um, if you can skip to uh, page, to slide number uh, 12. Uh, I've taken these different um, uh, formulas and calculated uh, what the future income might be from the Parmenter and the Crosby and what the future costs might be. And if you take the current lease rates over 20 years, the Crosby uh, total income is about $2.79 million and the Parmenter income is about $3.6 million. If you add to that a 2.5% per year growth, you pick up another in respectively $800,000 or $1 million. So the total 20 year income is about three and a half million or 4.6 million for, respectively for each of those buildings. Now it might be possible to raise rents beyond the current rent and the expected interest rates, but that's an uh, expected inflation rates, but that's a negotiation between the owner and the, and the, and the uh, renters or lessees. And if the, if the uh, rate goes too high, uh, people, people might move out or leave. On the other hand, if we borrow the money that we need for the Thompson School, a tr traditional bond, 20-year bond at 4.1% interest, we're winding up with uh, around $2.3 million in cost applied to those buildings. And the, um, the total cost of that bond, the capital cost of improving the buildings, the operating cost, in the case of the Crosby, will come to about, uh, about 5.4 million, in the case of the Parmenter, around 4.5 million. So in the Crosby case, we'd be substantially losing money, and in the case of the Parmenter, we'd be roughly about break even. Now this is using a theoretical formula, but you and I know that we have had huge expenses. We're looking at $8 million for the, for the community safety building. We've spent tens of millions of dollars on our different school buildings. So this is, this is in, a, in the gross sense, a very conservative cost. So I think that the, the town is highly exposed in, main, in continuing to own these buildings. And at the same time, we have the obligation to finance the uh, uh, building of the Thompson School. There is a lease price which would make it possible to, um, to fund these schools, and there's also a sale price that would do it. It's important, I think, to give the town, uh, the town manager and the board of selectmen, the flexibility to lease or sell so that they have some teeth in their, in, uh, in their negotiations. If we put total constraints on their negotiating activities, we can be sure that we won't get a good lease deal and we won't get a good sale deal. So I suggest that, if possible, I ask you to vote and support the uh, recommendations of the Board of Selectmen. Thank you. It's 9.30, let's take our 10 minute break. There's some kids of some sort out there selling stuff.
No thanks, no thanks. Please come on in and take your seats. Mr. Carmen, you're next on the list. Mr. Carmen has the floor. Please be quiet. There we go. Oh, should I wait? Should I when go? You, whenever they're quiet enough for you. Go ahead. I would have told you about Ready? Set? Yep. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dean Carmen, Precinct 20, and a member of the Finance Committee. I rise in support of the selectmen's motion as amended by Mr. Warden. Um, I'll try not to duplicate a lot of what Mr. Foskett said and maybe talk about some of the things some of the other speakers said and hopefully add a few new items. Um, I, I, just touching on what Mr. Foskett said, I, I, I agree with his main point, and his main point was that there's significant risk in owning a building that's not the core mission of the town. Um, you know, when we just look at the I just look at the cost of the Thompson. I try not to get into debating facts, and I try not to get in this person's chart versus that person's chart. And I look at the simple realization that we have old buildings, and that we have a Thompson school that's going to cost twenty million, million to re, to rebuild. So to think that rebuilding these two schools could be done cheaper or easier, it, it just it doesn't sort of it doesn't pass a, a smell test. Another issue I have, and I just want to talk about the sort of competing arguments about disposing of the assets through sale versus renting them out. During the Finance Committee hearings, when we were trying to figure this out, we had both renters in there and we had different people in there. One of the things we talked about at great length was increasing the value of the rent, you know, because it's one of the things we hear, if we just manage the building better, if we just increase the value of the rent, it's all going to be easy because we can fund, we can fund the, the capital expenditures and we can make everything perfect. Well. One of the things we learned is in 2009, these two buildings were put out to bid, the Parmenter and the Crosby. They're put out with their restrictions on them. So let's just, I walked through this logically in my head. The buildings were put out to bid. It was a public bid process. The highest bidder was awarded the lease. Therefore, my logic contends that the buildings are leased at fair market value. So to turn around and make an ass assessment that in a public, uh, to say that in a public bid process where the buildings went out to bid and the highest value was picked, that that's not the highest value. There's a mysterious higher value out there that we can get. We don't know who it is, we don't know where it is, but apparently they'll materialize. One of the other interesting things of note was we found out with the Crosby, when the Crosby, you know, the parliamentary we heard, the rent went up the last time significantly. The Crosby did not. The Crosby didn't go up because the tenant who's there now was the only person who bid. And when you're bidding against yourself, it's difficult, when you're, when it's difficult to have the rent go up. But it also poses another problem. It means we're one bidder away from having an empty building. The parmenter was a little bit of a different story. They had multiple bidders, the price could be moved up, and it could get to a point where you could get a higher rent, which is, but still not enough, as Mr. Foskett showed, when you combine them to support the building. So that gets back to my whole contention when I look at this of risk. If we have to dump significant money into these buildings at some point, there isn't a cash flow source, though there's a cash flow positive source right now, there will not be a positive cash flow source to sustain them. I also want to you know, talk about sort of a, another false choice that I thought was interesting. Mr. Schlickman had a point that these two schools could be you know, sold or transferred to a charter school. Well, St. Agnes and Arlington Catholic could be closed tomorrow and transferred to charter schools. Should we go in like marauders and shut the schools down and knock them down and do something? No. A lot of other buildings in this town, maybe even the old Brigham site, could be converted into a school. Really, any building that's zoned correctly could be converted into a charter school. So to pose a false choice to the town or the town meeting that this could be a charter school is just that. It, 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 it lacks, in my opinion, it lacks reason to, to work. And it also lacks reason for the first thing that I mentioned. There weren't any bidders the last time. Nobody wanted the Crosby. 
Charter schools didn't want them. They didn't come rushing in and said, man, we're going to build a charter school here. This will be great. There wasn't the market demand for it. And so, you know, and then the last point that I look at, and, and Mr. McCabe was talking about keeping the buildings in reserve for future use. Future use of any land requires a political process. And so I think of other things we're doing. I mean, I guess we could say we left part of Mass Ave in um, reserve for a future use so we could redesign it. The Mass Ave redesign is a very contentious process right now. Some people are for it, some people are against it. This very town meeting voted down alternative uses of cemetery space. So are we going to hold that space in reserve for cemeteries? I mean, it didn't work very well. When, you know, that proposal had a lot of difficulty when it was here before this meeting. So I don't think that any proposal or any sort of glowing hope that we're going to have a future need for this space or a future, you know, you know pressing town need that we're just going to call upon it and use the building is realistic. Lastly, I also think in that future need, you know, one of the thoughts that always goes back is, you know, maybe we can use them for schools if we ever need the school space again. But that goes back to the whole rebuild. You know, do we, how much is it going to cost to rebuild these as schools? Mill tens of millions of dollars. So after weighing sort of the choices and what I, the choices that I don't think are very plausible and looking at the risk, I always come back to the same thing. Over the long, over the short term, we can make money on these spaces. Absolutely. You know, we can have a positive cash flow depending on who puts their charts up of 300,000 plus. What we, what, we, what we have though is a longer term risk. And to me, when we do, like Mr. Foskett said, have a, an immediate need for a core service in this town, which is educating our children in adequate space, and we can help fund it with the money from the Thompson, from the sale of these buildings, and at the same time, not impact our other core services, because if we can't use this funding source, we're going to have to take out of the capital budget, which, you know, it's not widely discussed. We pull it up at the Finance Committee every now and then. Something on the order of 50% of all capital expenditures go to the children in the schools of this town. So you're just, you know, you think to yourself, well, there's another choice. You know, we just fund it through the capital budget. Well, you can, but now you're going to have to take away from other services, half of which are going to be the children of this town. So at the end, I would urge everybody, or I would urge you to support the main motion of the selectmen as amended by Mr. Warden, who I did do think put in great and reasonable protections and help us rebuild the Thompson. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Marr. John Marr, Precinct 14. I stand in strong support of the selectmen's motion and strong opposition to Mr. Warden's proposed amendment. Like each of you, I like to think that I like to live my life according to some principles. One of them, I like to keep my promises. We kept our promise to the Thompson neighborhood the other night, but I think that there are other promises that we have to keep uppermost. And one is to lessen as the extent possible the impact of the rebuild project as a whole, and Thompson in particular, uh, as it affects the taxpayers. Now, it's been suggested that it is a de minimis effect uh, whether or not we uh, sell these two schools on that uh, impact on the tax rate. But I think we need to send a message as we go out uh, on an override in a very short period of time to the taxpayers that we are taking a look at what the town can do to reduce the tax rate and, and the impact of the rebuild. To me, that's a promise that we need to keep as well. If you look at the process of the uh, schools as a whole over the years, we had a larger number of schools. We had nine elementary schools at one point. It was felt that uh, the population of the students uh, was such that we needed to reduce and, and constrain those and reduce the number of uh, schools available. This is a continuation, in my mind, of that continuum. Those schools were left over. They are available now to help us finish our rebuild promise to the town. But please keep in mind the promise that we, I think we have made as well to the taxpayers. Another principle, uh, as I say, we all live our, uh, uh, our lives by principles. I think a principle that this town ought to stand for is affordable housing. Now, Mr. Warden's uh, amendment, although it's dressed up in educational clothes, is an anti-affordable housing amendment, in my view. Uh, its first permutation was quite explicit, that it said that any uh, use that uh, would be devoted to affordable housing 
uh, uh, would take advantage of Chapter 40B uh, would, uh, uh, would, would be restricted. You couldn't have that. He was advised, presumably, that was illegal, and it was. But now it's uh, here in, uh, the, I think, a wolf in sheep's clothing. And I think that this town has stood for affordable housing. We need to do that now. I would uh, therefore suggest that you uh, strongly support the selectman's uh, proposed motion uh, and uh, defeat Mr. Warden's amendment. Uh, I would also like to uh, just respond to a couple of other issues that were raised. Mo first and foremost, why are we holding these buildings? They are not our core mission, as Mr. Foskett so eloquently suggested to you. Um, I think that, you know, th these are not like playgrounds. We, we have a paucity of pl playgrounds uh, now, but I think we can certainly get rid of these uh, get, uh, to sell them at an appropriate uh, price. Uh, but again, uh, I strongly urge you to stand up for promises that we made, not only to the Thompson neighborhood, but to our taxpayers, as well as promises that why I think the town should stand for, and that's affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Hainer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bill Hainer, Precinct 2. Uh, I think I have an answer for Mr. Schlickman. Uh, charter schools uh, take public funds, and as such, uh, they're required to upgrade for uh, handicapped people and things of that nature. And if any charter school can afford to bring either of these buildings up to code, uh, good luck to them. I don't think they would even consider it. Uh, I would ask, like to ask uh, the selectman or the town manager, if I understood it right, uh, any money on the sales of these buildings would be going to, the, uh, to lower the uh, Thompson? We, that, um, Mr. Sullivan, can you direct such money in that way? Uh, the money would go into the uh, general fund and then could be redirected by town meeting towards the project. So the town meeting would, would control that aspect of it? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I would recommend that you hold out for $10 million on each building and that should take care of the Thompson schools. Um, the, the other fact uh, on this, I, I have mixed feelings about supporting uh, the amendments on this. Um, I, do, I did have a concern, as Mr. Schlickman at the beginning, on the charter schools, because I think that could have a devastating effect on the public schools in the town. But I think that's covered with the, the cost. Is the Palmetto School, uh, I was told at the break, it's in the historic district. Does that mean that it cannot be torn down at any time? Ms. Rowe? <clears throat> No, there's, um, um, it would have to go to the Historic District Commission, and they would have to give you permission. Um, there is a demo, something called a demolition delay, so there's about a year's worth of um, delay if somebody did that, but it's, it's, um, it goes to the Historic District Commission. And they decide but that, that delay, the, the only thing they could hold it up for is just one year? N not, no. Oh, it's a two, um, is it a two-year delay, Mr. Ward? Yeah. Come on up. It's cool. John Worden, Precinct 8, and a member of the Historic District Commission. Um, in the Historic District, which the Parmenter is, the Crosby is not, the Historic District Commission could prohibit the demolition. It controls any, ex any change to the exterior of the building. That's okay. not to say that changes aren't allowed, but they're only allowed if the Commission finds that they are appropriate for the building, the site, and the, and, and the neighborhood in general. Now, the, and the demolition delay bylaw, with respect to the chairman, um, uh, that uh, does not apply in the historic district because the right. historic district is supposed to provide the protections that the de demolition delay uh, would provide for houses or buildings on the inventory that are not within districts. Uh, and the exception to that is a 40B developer can blow through the historic district protections. And there's a case down at the Cape which specifically said that it was approved by the Supreme Judicial Court. They make mistakes too. Um, 
and, and so because the, the, the developer need get only one permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals and, and, and they can get consultation with the Historic District Commission but they don't have to uh, necessarily listen to them and, and, and adhere to them. So that, 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 that's why we thought restricting it to educational use. Now, I won't, when I, get, when I get the floor again, if, I will refer to Mr. Marr's uh, arguments, which I'm certainly not against affordable housing. Thank you. In that case, uh, I'm going to support, uh, and I urge the uh, town meeting to support the amendments. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Hooper? Uh, Gwyneth, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Gwyneth Hooper, Precinct 14. I've been a member of town meeting for 18 years and a resident of Arlington for 42 years. And I'm just going to speak for a very few minutes about how I, as co-founder of the Arlington Children's Center, felt a need to start such a program in Arlington, because there, there were none. Uh, in 1969 and 70, as many of you might remember, Women were going into the workforce in a way that they never had before, and there were no full-day, year-round programs to support working families. Uh, there were traditional nursery schools and Head Start, which is an income-eligible program. Um, and my former husband and I and two other couples in Arlington, none of us early childhood people, decided as community activists that we would open such a lovely quality program that families could use. It took us a year and a half because there was a great deal of resistance in Arlington at that time. And I was told in this very hall over and over again with a man holding his finger at me like this, do you think I'll ever forget that? No. <laughs> Mrs. Hooper, women with children belong at home. And you, Mrs. Hooper, you belong at home with your children. That's what they would say to me publicly in this room, in that hallway over there, they said to me, Mrs. Hooper, women should not be taking jobs away from men. I had grown up in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and I had thought that those issues had been put to rest, but that had not, was not true here. There were many uh, folks in Arlington who helped us start the, the program and who were in support of a full-day program, and we thanked them. Um, we did open in 1971 in the Trinity Baptist Church with nine children. As we grew through the years, we then moved to the Unitarian Church to have more space, and we evacuated 43 children the day of that fire when the church burned, March 1975. We then opened more classrooms in the First Baptist Church across from Johnny Foodmaster, and then in 1982, I got a lovely phone call from Alan McLennan telling me that they were going to be closing Parmenter that next year. And uh, he knew that we were looking for space. And so we applied, and we were happy to move in there the summer of 1983. I was familiar with the building. I had lived up the street. My own children had gone to Parmenter. I had been a, a parent volunteer there, a Girl Scout leader or Cub Scout leader there, and knew the space inside and out really well. We grew while we were there, and we had children as young as two-year-olds, toddlers, up through after school grades one through five. We actually opened the first after school program in this whole part of Massachusetts. And when we had the licensing ceremony, the commissioner came, channels four, five, and seven came. Uh, and we had this little ceremony in the third floor of the auditorium at Par Manor. Some of our families who left us uh, as their children outgrew our program, we often had children with us for eight years. They would start out as two-year-olds in the toddler room, and they would age out as 10-year-olds in the fifth grade of our after-school program. So, and this was year-round. We were open from 7.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. year-round, not closed for snow days unless the governor declares a state of emergency. And we had degree teachers on our staff. There was a team of four degree teachers in every classroom, one of whom was a head teacher. We had a director, an assistant director, an educational director who met with each team of teachers once a week to plan curriculum. We had a part-time nurse. We had a woodworking teacher and uh, a music teacher, and often people coming in to 
work with specialty art media, with, such as clay or whatever, with children. Then a group of our parents who had, whose children had outgrown our school were, in, were bracket parents. And they said, we need an after school program here. Gwen, will you help us open a program? So we helped to open, we're not the legal entity of, but we helped to open the bracket after school program, which takes care of children grades one through five. At the present time, in Parmenter, which we've loved being in that building, we have 188 children, 144 of whom are Arlington families. At the bracket after school program, we have 171 children, uh, and of course they're all Arlington families. So total, we have 360 children, 315 of whom are Arlington families. Our staff of 64 degreed teachers, half, almost half, 27 are Arlington residents. We would very much love to stay in the Parmenter building. We love the space inside and out. We love the neighborhood, it's a great location. Uh, and our preference would be for a long-term lease. If there are any questions that any of you have, and I am retired, but I'm a board member, if I can't answer them, Matthew Dolan, the present director, a resident of Marshfield, Mass, is in the building, and we would ask permission for him to speak if he needs to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hooper. Ms. LaCourt. Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15, and a member of the Board of Selectmen. Um, so obviously I support my own uh, motion. Um, I would like to address one thing that Mr. Warden raised about, uh, that is pertinent to his amendment, which I don't support, and then um, talk to you a little bit about how I came to this decision and urge you to support this as well. Um, I'm not pro 40B. I am pro affordable housing, and I am pro appropriate development for every site in Arlington. One of the things that uh, might happen if we, um, well, to respond to Mr. Warden's point about flexibility in the use on the property, the discussion that the Board of Selectmen had was about whether or not a 30-year or 20-year deed restriction would be appropriate and the question that was raised by my colleague Dan Dunn was, what happens if they're both the owner of the new owner of the property and the Board of Selectmen and the community as a whole agree that there's some new use that would be good on that property and good for the neighborhood, but it's not educational use and we've tied our hands. And so it's difficult, I think, to imagine making a 30-year decision that uh, there's no possibility of our regretting. But I don't think anybody on the Board of Selectmen would be terribly interested in um, allowing a school that came to us and said, oh, we want to sell the building for 10 times as much as we paid for it and take all that money, and you're going to be saddled with a denser development than you would allow by zoning, that anybody on the Board of Selectmen would vote to do that, now or any future board. Okay, So um, I don't think that that is a fear, and that's not why I would prefer that rather than tying our hands to a 30-year deed restriction as the only way that we can protect the use of the property, that you leave us the flexibility to have several options because it would also be part of the negotiation around the value that we'll get out of either a long-term lease or the sale of the building. It's just another tool in the toolbox because putting a 30-year deed restriction on that building and on that piece of land also reduces the value of it to some people who might be interested in buying it. So every restriction you put on the property is going to reduce its value in the marketplace because it narrows the number of people who might compete for the property. Okay, so why do I support the flexibility to either do a long-term lease or sell these buildings in order to support the rebuild of Thompson? Okay. We are not in an economic climate where there are easy choices left to make. These are resources that we have in our hands. We are not getting a lot of resources any longer from outside, from the state or the federal government. We can't count on increases in those resources. We made a promise to our children that we would rebuild the Thompson School. 
yes, there's more money than we're going to spend left in the debt exclusion as Mr. Loretti raised. Okay. Um, for those of you who know where I live, you'll understand why it is that I'm reminding you of this. We have a seventh school. And as passionate as each group of parents, as each school has come up to be rebuilt, as passionate as those parents have felt, and as you can see the passion that was in this room the other night, and they come in here and they are so relieved when we vote to fund the money for the building project they've all been dying for. I've been working on these rebuild projects since my oldest child was in kindergarten, and she is now a freshman in college, just finished her freshman year quite successfully, thank you very much. And I am dying to have a construction project in my front yard. We have a seventh school to do. The Stratton community is waiting. And despite the fact that my children are not in that building, I am as passionate about the eventual need to rebuild that school as any parent in any of the six other schools, even now, when I have no children in that building and even knowing I will have no children in the public schools by the time that we do it. So I would suggest that we need to reserve some portion of this debt exclusion for that final school building. So how are we to fund this rebuild? Well, when it was first proposed to me, the one way we could fund this rebuild was by disposing of, on a long-term basis, these properties. I was actually very excited about it because I don't consider managing real estate part of our core responsibilities, and I don't think we do it very well. And since I work for a consortium of affordable housing developers and I spend a lot of time on the phone looking at pro formas and budgets and actual to budget with asset managers, I can tell you it's a high art. We are probably not getting the maximum value we can out of those buildings. And we are never going to, they're never going to be anything in terms of property management but a distraction to us. I don't think there's a future use for these buildings, but we asked the school committee to tell us that when we asked them to vote on whether or not to surplus those buildings. And the school committee, I hope, made a smart, forward-thinking, data-driven decision to surplus those buildings and that we will not be putting schools back on those properties at any time in the future. The cost of any other use, of in renovating those buildings or razzing those buildings and having open space is enormous. And you've heard Mr. Foskett explain to you what all the risks are in continuing to own them. We have 12 to 15 years of deferred maintenance on those buildings. And we are not going to be able to pass all of that on to the leaseholders. Certainly not unless we're able to exchange it for a very long-term lease. And we need the money that we are going to be able to get from these assets to maintain another asset that we're actively using, which is the Thompson School. Okay. Often these days, I am told in the political sphere that what government has to learn to do is to make hard choices. Well, we are the government and we have to make some hard choices. I know this is a hard choice to give up town properties. It's not a decision you take lightly. I certainly wouldn't be standing here before you asking you to give up an asset for any other purpose than to maintain another asset. You know, you don't borrow on your home equity to pay your Amex bill. So I hope that you will support the board's vote and you will give us the flexibility to maximize what we can get out of these buildings to put towards the renovation of the Thompson School. And I hope that you will not support Mr. Warden's amendment because I think that it may take away flexibility from us that we need to maximize the value that we get out of these properties and may at some future point need to maximize the value the community gets out of them. Should there be some idea that comes up in the next 30 years other than using these properties as a school building that looks like a win-win for both the community and whoever the private owner at that time is, I don't want our hands to be tied any more than they absolutely need to be to protect the community's interest. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ruderman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9. Boy, has the weather been lousy lately? Mm -hmm. Uh, if there's any benefit to a long, cold, rainy weekend, it gives you time to uh, uh, play with numbers and um, go through some exercises that, that uh, if you didn't have a professor standing over you waiting for um, 
uh, comparative use and uh, redevelopment analysis in a uh, real estate uh, finance class. You wouldn't be doing anyway, except if the issue were coming up at town meeting. So I bring, I, I bring some, uh, some uh, shop-worn but, but recently refreshed analytical skills to looking at, at the abundance of data that we've been presented with uh, costs and, and benefits of, of a proposed sale of, of the Parminter School. Let me first say that I, I believe in my heart that affordable housing is a moral imperative and 40B stinks as a means of instituting it. I respectfully disagree with Mr. Carmen's analysis that in the last two years, the climate for the formation of new charter schools has accelerated rapidly, especially in densely populated towns in the greater Boston, greater Boston metropolitan core that have old and disused buildings, which the neighborhood already likes having schools in, in towns which are experiencing upheaval in their school departments, causing uh, the layoff of teachers and the overcrowding of children in the existing public school classrooms. I believe that the Thompson rebuild issue that I have been working on ever since I was a member of the school facilities working group more than 10 years ago is a canard, a false question, a total obfuscation of the purpose of our vote two nights ago and a perversion of all the discussions that have gone into rebuilding Thompson and Stratton up to this date, never, never, did anyone come before us or was it ever proposed in the school facilities working group that we should sell the Fox Branch Library to rebuild the Dahlin? Or that we should, re we should sell the community safety building to rebuild the Bracket or the Pierce? Why? Well, we could, we could move people around. They're old. They cost a lot of money to maintain. The roof leaks like a sieve and the cracks are yay deep in the concrete. No. We didn't even consider the, the question of selling town assets. We weren't going to look at selling off one piece of our patrimony in order to preserve another. And I would contend that, that the present use of the Parmenter School, while not strictly public in the legal definition of we, the taxpayers, are funding something that happens there, it is a school. And it is beloved by the people that use it. It's beloved by the neighborhood. It's beloved by the generations of students who've passed through it. I believe that the assumptions that we're getting tonight are fueled by what, if I may term the Gibson principle, which is the selectmen want this money like I want wings on game day, that the assumptions that are made in, in the numerical analysis all tend to err or nudge on the side of the sale. In fact, I can speak with some familiarity to two Harvard universities. Uh, uh, deferred maintenance number has bounced wildly over the number of years that they've been trying to hit me up to fund it. The Sherman, the Sherman Durgis analysis misses two, two very significant pillars uh, when it comes to uh, the Parmenter School. One, it's based on post-war construction. Two, it's based on modified accelerated cost recovery depreciation. They don't apply to something that's 85 years old, maxed out in depreciation, and built in an age where school buildings were expected to live for a century. Do you notice something about our public buildings in town, that there seems to be this gulf around the 40, 50, 55 year mark, that the ones that were built in that gulf were crap? and the ones that were built before it are still here? <laughs> so some old buildings are worth saving. I believe the loss of usefulness of the park would be serious given, given a maxed out redevelopment of the, of the uh, property immediately next door to it. I think that this is a sad and somewhat ingenuous conflation of goals to hold, at least in principle, the rebuild of the Thompson and future rebuild of the Stratton hostage, or in any way connected, because it doesn't say here, in any way connected with what town assets we may or may not decide to sell. I will vote against this. I hope you will too. Thank you, sir. Mr. Dunn.
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Dan Dunn, Precinct 21, and a member of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, as town meeting, we need to do what is best uh, for the town. And, one of the th and what's best for the town is at least partially a financial question, but it's also partially what is the best use for the town. It's not just about the money, it's also about what we're going to be using these properties for. I'm asking you to support this motion and to vote against uh, Mr. Warden's amendment because it permits us to keep our options open and it permits us to maximize the value that we're going to get from these town assets over the long run. Keep in mind, when I said that value, I'm saying that that value is composed of two parts, both the financial part and the usage that we've got there. It's, it, uh, I thought uh, Mrs. Hooper's speech about uh, the history was fascinating. I, I learned things tonight that I didn't know about it. I have also been, uh, toured some of these buildings and looked at them and, ta and talked about uh, what the schools are. We have some really good usage that is happening in both of these places. Uh, the, tenant, the current tenants are adding a lot of value to the town. And so I think that we should continue to support that. So, as a board of, and I mean this as the board of selectmen, we're going to try also try to do what is best for the town. And, we're, and when we do that, that's pro, that is also going to involve supporting the current tenants. Let's, I, let's walk through what that'll look like. If we've, the town meeting move, votes to move forward with this, what we'll do is we'll get an appraisal done of the two properties, uh, which is different from the RKG report, a different but like an honest to God appraisal of what they're worth. We'll put it out to bid, and we'll see what bids do we come back, and then we'll decide. There's some really important things to think about that that are underneath that word decide. First of all, we will not be obligated to do anything. We do not have, if we vote this, if town meeting votes this today, and if the bids, we do the appraisal, and the bids come in, the Board of Selectmen are not obligated to sell. They are not obligated to enter into a long-term lease. We get to evaluate all of the options and make a decision. It's also important that we're not obligated to treat them the same. Parmenter and Crosby are two very different buildings in two very different situations with very different tenants. Some of those tenants have indicated that they're much more interested in leasing. Some of them have interested, indicated that they're more interested in buying and we can work with that to see what works out best. The reason that we have to approve this in order for this to work and go forward is that we need that appraisal and we need those bids in order to figure out what the financial value of this property is. If we vote no on this, then there won't be a meaningful price, there won't be meaningful bids, and we will have a very difficult time maximizing the value of this for, uh, asset for the town. So I ask you to uh, and support the motion, vote against the amendment, and please keep our options open so that we can maximize the value of this asset, both the financial and the gifts that it gives to the town. Oh, and by the way, Red Sox are tied in the bottom of the 800. I believe it's Mr. I believe it's Mr. Simus. Oops, shorten you a couple seconds. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Charlie Simus, Precinct 3, and I rise to support the article with Mr. Warden's amendment. I'm not going to talk about any kind of figures, which is because I don't care about that. I'm talking as a resident. It was 1962 when I first bought the house at 42 Oxford Street. It's across from the Crosby School. And uh, since they, I've been there for many years, I saw it as a grammar school. Fine. And when I saw it close, I was quite disappointed. Didn't know what was going to happen. When schools for children came in there, I really didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what they were going to do. I don't think they knew what they were going to do with the place. But since they've been there, all I can say, they have been very good neighbors, and I'm quite happy with them as a neighbor. I'd like to see them stay there as a neighbor. That's why I'd like to see Mr. Warden's amendment come in here and keep it with the schools for children and stay there. Now, I don't think there's a line of people coming to give bids for the Crosby School. There isn't that many people interested in the Crosby School. As far as the rents go, 
you're not going to go too high on the rents over there. Schools for Children, Mr. Wilson, his hands are tied. He can only go so high on the students that are coming in there. So I'd like to see the town get the biggest bang for its buck. <laughs> Great, but you know, I don't think you're really going to see it. So that's all that I have to say, and I'm a longtime member, first time talking to this body, and I'm looking around here. I don't think that many of us are going to be here in 30 years. I know I won't. <laughs> have a good day. Thank you. Mr. Fisher? Uh, Andrew Fisher, Precinct 6. Uh, I'm opposed to selling these two buildings, and I hope you vote no. Um, first, I want to respond to the idea that we have uh, an obligation to vote yes in order to fund the uh, Thompsons. Um, I did work on the earlier uh, override, and I guarantee you I would have opposed the override if it had said we're going to sell any town property um, in order to fund any of the schools. It, uh, I think it's unwise. Um, both of these locations are part of the heritage of the town, and it, I almost feel that this generation doesn't have the right to, to sell that heritage. And it's more than heritage, it's also the potential to use the building for other uses uh, in the future. S specifically, um, there's a Paul, Paul Krugman article in the New York Times uh, Friday. Right now there are 20 seniors for every 100 people in the workforce on Medicare. And in a few years that number is going to be 29. So I don't know exactly how many people are going to be elderly in Arlington 10 or 20 years from now, but it's going to be a lot. And we may need another senior center. Who knows? Not that, those, not that either of those buildings are perfectly suited, but when we sell them, we lose that flexibility. And that is part of the town's core mission is, is to maintain our heritage and maintain, as one slide above said, uh, the social safety net for seniors and, and that sort of thing. Um, I believe that the Thompson can be funded in other ways, and, and I'm going to vote no on this. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Trembley. Harry, I got gotcha. you. It's not going to make you come any quicker because you keep Ed raising your hand. Go ahead, Ed. Sorry. That's all right. Uh, Ed Trumbly, Precinct 19. Um, I have some questions about the, uh, the lease rates. Uh, we, we've, we've talked uh, some about how the, uh, um, we put these out to bid and the, the, the leases... Uh, came back not the, uh, with not the highest value in the world. Uh, I'm curious if, uh, if anybody knows if we put these out to a long-term lease where uh, the tenant could be assured that they were going to be there for a while, if, uh, if the, the lease rights might be more advantageous. Mr. Sullivan, who let the last leases? Uh, that was the ARB. I believe they were relatively short-term, our renewals. But if we were to go out to uh, bid for leases, they would be long-term. And, and w w would financially, would they be more advantageous to the time, town, do you think, with a uh, long-term lease rather than a short-term lease? I suspect uh, it would provide them more st stability and probably would be uh, better. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, we probably would require them to put into escrow some type of capital renewal fund. Um, so I don't know how that'll play into it, but um, that'll be one of the provisions uh, in the long-term lease. Um, the uh, Mr. Sullivan, when he was making his initial comments, uh, said something about the age of the plumbing and the wiring, and uh, I think I remember reading in paperwork something about the boiler. 
Um, I was just curious, it, it, the, uh, the current lease that uh, is currently in place, who's responsible for maintaining those? Who knows the intimate details of the lease? Mr. Sullivan? In terms of uh, maintaining the lease, uh, it's the Board of Selectmen that signed the lease? No, if, if the boiler breaks, who fixes oh, it? Oh, the actual maintenance of it? Yeah. It'd be town uh, facilities people. Really? Because every commercial property that I've ever been involved with, and uh, I've been aware uh, either part of or aware of the details on a number of commercial leases were all triple net, which meant that as a tenant, we had to take care of everything. We were responsible for the wiring, the plumbing. If the heat didn't work, that was our problem. And the only thing that the landlord ever took care of was the outside envelope of the building. So I'm wondering if, if we're having long-term leases on these buildings, or even short-term, why, are, why aren't we writing the uh, leases with the, the standard commercial triple net leases that, that uh, make the tenants responsible for all the interior stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we don't have the expertise for property management, and that's probably one of the things that should have been in there and will be in any uh, long-term lease going forward. Okay, so, so then uh, as far as the, uh, the, the, the risk factors involved here, the, the risk is substantially reduced if we're not in charge of, if we don't have to worry about the uh, you know, day-to-day -day wiring and plumbing and, uh, and boilers and things like that. That's correct. As I mentioned, like the capital renewal fund, that's the type of thing uh, that the uh, tenant will be required to put aside so that there'll be money there for those type of repairs. So, I mean, it, it, it sounds to me like if, if we lease these on a long-term basis, um, the, the terms could be much more adva advantageous to the town than they currently are because, A, we'll reduce our liability, uh, our, our risk to problems, and we'll increase the amount of money we get from, from this. And it's, and it's a recurring thing every, every year. I mean, I'm struck by... You know, you drive around Boston or drive around the entire country and there's commercial properties all over the place. And I haven't really noticed that many commercial landlords are really trying to get rid of their properties because they're afraid of the risk. And so it seems to me that if we kept ha hung on to them and, and actually leased them out at advantage, how do I put this? Um, lease this out a car, uh, on the terms that, that standard commercial leases are, are, uh, are, are issued, that um, the town might actually do all right with this. Thank you. Mr. Lobel. Uh, Josh Lobel, Precinct 8. Um, this is a very interesting question and an uh, interesting group of people have spoken on it. When Mr. McCabe spoke, I thought, well, when it got to me by turn, <clears throat> I would pass because he said most of the things I was planning to say. But since we've had so many uh, conversations after that, I just wanted to bring up a few things. Um, the first question is to the moderator, if we vote this, is this a two-thirds vote for this or is there a subsequent vote that has to be taken? If they were, the if their sale the, was going to be made, the final vote would have to be two thirds of this motion. Of, well, no, the I mean, we're not voting to kind of study it and then vote next year. We're voting. If we vote to sell it, we're selling it. We're done. Releasing. It's up to them. So this is a two thirds vote. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and it seems to me there's sort of two things that we're uh, juggling. <clears throat> One is the amount of income we would get from a sale. And again, my finances aren't very uh, sophisticated. I oftentimes miss a decimal. But I think if we're getting $3 million, if we divide that by roughly 20,000 households by 20 years, it is uh, $10 a month, $10 a year per household, something like that. Is that does anyone want to confirm that? Your math is better than mine. It, it's, I think that number is about right. So it's <clears throat> $10, maybe it's $20 a household per year if we want to factor in more things. So in terms of the income of the sale, I think that 
that, that doesn't persuade me. <clears throat> in terms of the risk of the uh, maintenance on the building, I think that uh, Mr. Tremblay has brought that up. Uh, there are probably ways to deal with that, and again, that's not a huge amount of money, and so that doesn't really persuade me either. In terms of management of the building, have we looked at um, private management or, or having, hiring a private company to do that? Mr. Sullivan, have anybody done that? Uh, no, done it in-house. Okay, so I mean, that, that would be another possibility. I, I don't really know the cost, but one of my colleagues said that might be 6% of the, of the um, income per year, so maybe $18,000 a year for that uh, service. That seems reasonable, reasonable to me. Um, some people have mentioned the word override. I want to make it clear to everybody an override is much different than a, a debt exclusion. A debt exclusion is $3 million over 20 years, let's say, whereas an override is $3 million per year. So that's much different in terms of the cost of the taxpayers. Um, in terms of the use of the building, uh, ACC, I think, is a, is a great use of it. They've say, said that they want to stay there, and it's my impression that they would find that much easier to do if it was leased versus they put them in a position where they have to buy it. Um, in terms of use of the space, uh, it's my understanding that the enrollment in the schools is currently growing. We live in a town where we have a very high ratio of adults to students. I think we have 40,000 plus people with a, a school population of 4,000. Lexington has uh, 25,000 people with a, roughly the same population. So there is possibility that we could grow. And actually, we, we were quite a, a bit larger in terms of enrollment a, a number of years ago. And I can tell you right now that I know the Odyssey is kind of bursting at the seams, um, as are many of the elementary schools. Um, in terms of charter school use of the building, uh, I don't know if the, a charter school could perhaps just use the first floor and not have to make a lot of ADA uh, modifications. One thing that's very appealing to me is uh, maybe we could do some of the benefits that a charter school offers in our own buildings with our own personnel. Maybe we could have a small magnet school that is kind of centered around a particular um, strength, if it's the arts or uh, Whatever. Um, so that's that. And then finally, I, I'd have to echo uh, Mr. Schlickman's comments from uh, the beginning of town meeting, which seems like a long time ago, when we were talking about cemeteries. And he said, that decision is forever if we, if we turn it over. If we sell this building, and especially if we do it at a time of sort of tight economic times, I think that's the, the worst reason to do it, because we're, we're hopefully going to pass out of that. Um, and if we sell it, it's gone. And if we do want to use some, that space for something else, we're never going to be able to buy up that much space again. Or it's certainly, it's going to be much more difficult to buy it than to, than to uh, sell it. So uh, summing up, I'm not in favor of selling it. I think it would be a, a large mistake. And um, I urge you to agree with me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Koch. Kevin Koch, Precinct 16. Uh, I share many of Mr. McCabe's and, uh, and Mr. Lobel's concerns. Um, if, if building maintenance were such a risk, then in the limit we would sell all of our buildings and lease them back. But guess what? If we did that, the owner would charge us the cost of maintaining the building plus a return on their investment. So that's why people build buildings, to, to make a return on their investment. So I, I can't buy into the argument that, that owning buildings is intrinsically risky. All buildings need maintenance. Um, so I, it, it, I guess I have one question, which is, it, would there be any way to take the sale option off the table from this uh, measure and only uh, entertain lease options. You, you could make a, an, a motion to amend uh, if you wished. Um, the uh, selectmen have the authority to lease on their own, so if you just wanted the lease option, I suppose you just vote the article down because the selectmen what, could. Do, do the selectmen have the option to uh, engage in a long-term lease at this point? Yes. 
Yes. Uh, yeah, they could, they could uh, engage in a long-term lease, and as I mentioned, they could require a capital replacement fund, so they're responsible for all that. Um, but I'm not sure that if you own the property or I own the property, I'd want to do that. I'd want to make sure that I get you know, the best price possible that I could. I want to have all the options open in front of me and have the people that are bidding on it know that I have options and weigh all those options. Uh, if we go out to bid with just a lease option, um, I'm not sure what kind of bids we get. What if they get uh, no bids or very low bids? No one's willing to fund the capital replacement fund. Where do we go from there? Just having the two options, I think, uh, is in the best interest of the town. I think, really, I think, in a way, carrying out our fiduciary responsibility, taxpayers to get the most that we can, while at the same time building in the protections for the neighborhood, you know, for the existing tenants, giving them preference, restricting it to pri private uh, educational use. I think that's the best option. Well, I think that this is probably uh, close to the worst possible time to sell property based on the current state of the economy. So uh, with the same concerns as Mr. McCabe and Mr. LaBelle, I, I uh, urge voting this down. Thank you. Mr. Berger? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> Excuse me, Eric Berger, Precinct uh, 6. I, uh, I urge you to vote against uh, the sale of these buildings. And I want to speak in particular to uh, Article uh, 38 because I'm familiar with uh, the Parmenter School. Uh, I mentioned last week in remarks to you that um, I was an educational uh, administrator in the past and a teacher. And I mention it only now because, um, you know, I worked at for 29 years as an administrator in elementary schools and high schools and as a district administrator. And I mention it because I do know something about uh, educational environment, educational um, philosophy, educational research. Now, I want to tell you, what I didn't tell you, though, is that for the last three years, once a week, I volunteer at the Arlington Children's Center. And I bring that up to tell you that I know this school. I see it, I know it firsthand, and I am telling you, we talked tonight about resources and getting the most from our assets. That school is fabulous. I am telling you, that is one heck of a resource. Not only does it provide childcare for kids from age two up, but it provides, it's a school. It doesn't just take care of kids, you know, uh, filling the day. I mean, there is a excellent curriculum in that school. It's guided by a philosophy that treats those kids with love and respect, and I, and, I, and I see it. The relationships in that school between the staff and the, and the kids is beautiful. It's consistent, whether it's in the playground, in the classes, wherever. That is a gem. I'm telling you, it's fabulous. And you heard before tonight, about how many kids it serves in Arlington, over 140. A vital service to working families in this town. Now, I, I believe that if, this, if that building is sold, or that option is out there, I believe it'll drive away the school. I think when you heard tonight from the, you know, the woman who who's, uh, started this school, fabulous, um, Mrs. Hooper, she said that she prefers a long-term lease. Now, this, that, that, that school has been there since 1983 in that building. It's served many families in this town. It's a very good, uh, you know, it's paid its money every year. And I'm sure the town can negotiate a long-term lease that meets its needs for uh, renovation, et cetera, et cetera, maintenance, upkeep, with the Arlington Children's Center. If that school leaves this town, and has to go somewhere else, find another building. It's one heck of a loss to the town. You talk about resources, assets. You lost a big one right there. And I'm not kidding you because, as I said, I've been in that school every week for three years. And I know something about what, what good and not. And that is a gem. A gem. 
And if you don't believe me, go, go spend time there and watch the staff with those kids, two years and up. And sit in the classroom and watch what they teach those kids and how they work with them. They have a core mission that's beautiful. Early childhood oriented. Creative. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Doherty. Leo Doherty, Precinct 19. Can we move the question and everything on the question? Thank you. On all, on all, all issues before the article? Absolutely. Okay. We have a motion to terminate debate on all issues before the article. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. My opinion, it is a two-thirds vote. Okay, we have two substitute motions before us. One substitute and then an amendment. We have Ms. Rose, substitute motion, and then Mr. Warden's amendment. So. It will only make sense, in my opinion, to vote on Ms. Rose's substitute motion. If that passes, then we'll vote on Mr. Warden's amendment to her motion. Then we're going to vote on the final vote as amended or not. Mr. So, Moderator. Is that kind of clear? Could I have some clarification, please? Yeah. Um, if we have a two thirds vote, is it two thirds of the 250 town meeting members or two thirds of the amount of people who checked in tonight? It's two-thirds of the people in the hall voting right now. So do you know how many are here? Do you want to stand and vote? Well, I know, but I everybody doesn't vote. I can tell you six vote. people voted no. What? I could hear six voices say no. No, I don't mean that. I mean, when we vote on this, do you know how... I mean, everybody doesn't no, always vote. No, no, we, vote. we don't... It's not how many people checked in tonight. It's how, not how many people... Our quorum is 62 people. Okay, it's it's two-thirds two of, of the people in the hall at the moment we vote. Okay. Who votes? Yeah. Okay, so I'll say it again. First, we're going to vote on Ms. Rowe's substitute. If that passes, then we're going to vote on Mr. Warden's amendment to her substitute motion. Whether or not that passes, we are then going to vote again for the final vote if Ms. Rose passes as amended or not amended. Wait a second, Mr. Hainer. What purpose do you rise, Mr. Marr? Yes. I'm not sure why I understand Ms. Rose's motion to be a, a substitute. It's my understanding that it was it's adopted by the selectmen and therefore is the by definition nope, they, under the bylaws is the main motion. No, they I, had they had a different motion in their report that said vote of the selectmen I, and that she's presented a substitute motion tonight. It's, it's, it's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, I might be wrong, that uh, they simply decided to abandon the original one and no. now making this the selectmen's main motion. If that is the case, it's, I have never sat in this assembly before and have a main motion voted before the amendment. The amendment is always voted first because that informs people about what eventually they're going to be voting on. It seems to me the common sense way, and a subject to your ruling, okay, which I, I will, of course, speak? respect, that the Ms. amendment Mark, ought Ms. to be Mark, voted may first. I speak? No one withdrew the initial motion of the, the selectment, so it's still before us. The original one in their report is still before us. We have to substitute it, which their substitute motion did. She didn't get up and say, we withdraw our original motion, we're going to substitute it. So we got to vote on it. We could have voted on it by now. But, but why would it, that it, John, it, John, amends, it amends the selectman's motion regardless of a substitute no, or not. No, she is substituting her motion for the motion that's I, currently I before us. I'm not going to argue with you, Mr. Ma. I'm going to do the vote the, the way chair. I want to. I'm simply saying I defer to the chair. I am going to do the vote the way I want to because it's clear to me, and I think it's clear to everybody else. Mrs. Ma, Mrs. Rowe has a substitute motion which she discussed tonight, which takes place of the one which was in their voted package they gave us earlier. That has not been withdrawn. We have her May 11th motion that says substitute motion. We're going to vote on that. Yes, Mr. McCabe. We have three things before us now. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. 
Harry McKay, Precinct 21. I believe the quantum of vote is two-thirds of those present and that's voting. That's true. That's not what you said. Yeah, I thought you so. You said it was two-thirds of those in the hall present and voting. So if they don't vote, we don't count them. Correct. And they're not part of the vote. I agree with you. Thank you. Now, in my opinion, we have three things. Mrs. Fiore, yes. I can't hear you. I'm sorry, Elsa Fiore, Precinct 2. And I'm, I'm still confused because if the original motion has not been taken out. Correct. And we're going to vote on uh, the chairman's substitute motion. Correct. And then if we turn that down, we're going to vote on. No, if we turn that down, there's no use voting on Mr. Mars, Mr. Excuse me, Mr. Warden's motion because there's nothing to amend. If, so if Clarissa's motion dated May 11th wins, we're going to vote on Mr. Warden's, see if we want to amend it or not. Okay. If it loses, then we have before us the original vote, which was printed in their report that was given to us. Yeah, but I thought that's what we've been discussing all night. We've been discussing the May 11th, Mr. Warden's. We've been discussing whether or not we just want to sell the apartment to school and why. But, but if we vote against... Uh, if you vote against everything, they can't sell the school. Okay, so that means we have to vote against the original motion, too, if we don't want it. If you don't want to sell the school, you vote no every okay. time I ask you to vote. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Come on, let, let's, can we just vote on this? We're no, on. no more, I'm, st I'm stuck. Why, why is this confusing? This is not confusing. <sighs> this is ridiculous. What, I have to start a list for points of order? No more points of order. It's very simple. No, I have four guys back there. Yeah, put, put, uh, can you put Ms. Clarissa Rowe's motion up? No. She Mr. Doesn't, Moderator. Doesn't have it. What, Mr. Tully? Is, thank you. Is, Joe Tully, Precinct 14. Is there a reason why the chair cannot withdraw the original? We could have voted on the darn thing by now and been done and not the 39. Well, I, I, I agree, but it seems to be causing some confusion. Is there a reason why she can't withdraw it at this point? Let's just vote and get it done with. Clarissa, can you withdraw your original motion as presented in your reports? No, we can't do it. Let's just vote. No more points of order. No, no, what? Who are you anyways? Carl Wagner, Hi, Precinct Carl. 11. Yeah, usually sit up front and move the question. I like you. <laughs> because, I, because you may be against the idea of disposing of Article 38's property, you might be given to support uh, Mr. Warden's amendment. In the order that you propose, you basically have to vote yes, yes, yes. I think that that's ridiculous. We should vote on the amendment that Mr. Warden proposed first nothing, if you want to vote there's no. There's nothing to amend. I'm the guy who makes a decision on how I'm we sorry. vote. We can vote on Mr. Warden's amendment, but there's nothing to amend because we haven't accepted the substitute. It makes no sense. All right, we're going to vote now. We're going to vote now. Stop asking me questions. It took 10 minutes. We could have been done and on to 39. We're now going to vote on Miss Rose's substitute motion dated May 11th, which specifically asks if you want to sell the buildings for not less than a million seven. All in favor of her substitute motion, please say yes. Yes. All opposed, say no. No. In my opinion, her substitute motion is defeated. So now we don't have to vote on Mr. Warden's substitute motion because there's nothing to vote on. Yeah, there's nothing to vote on. Now we go back to the original motion of the Board of Selectmen that says the board being hereby is authorized to dispose of the apartment to school and its appurtenant lands by sale, lease, or otherwise. All in favor of that original motion, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. Okay, thank you. Well, we could either adjourn or go to 39. 39. 
That brings us to Article 39. Yes, Mr. McCorry. Huh? Uh, I didn't hear you mention uh, your ruling on the previous voice vote. It's, uh, it's a negative vote. Yes, I didn't yeah, hear you say that. Negative. I didn't hear you say that. Thank you. Thank you. It was defeated. All right, we have now before us Article 39. Um, Ms. Rowe. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I would like, first of all, to withdraw the original um, motion. Um. Excuse me, ma'am? I I'm would like to withdraw the original motion. All in favor of withdrawing the original motion of the Board of Selectmen is printed in their report. Please say yes. Yes. All opposed? It is, the original motion is withdrawn. All right, um, I would like to propose the substitute motion, which you all hopefully have in front of you. It's the one on the back of the, um, <clears throat> with a map on the back <clears throat> that the Board of Selectmen be and hereby is authorized to dispose of the Crosby School. Um, I don't need to read it, do I? No. Um, what I wanna say about this motion and what I was gonna try to get up and talk about before is, um, yes, these are money-making articles, but it's more important to really talk about the entities that are in, that are in the school now, like WENS, um, School for Children, um, and how important that has been in our town. We're now talking about the Crosby School which has been a wonderful neighbor for um, the people that live around the Crosby School. They are, we want to work with them. They have tremendous interest in buying this, this piece of land. So I'd like you to open your minds up a little bit and think that, please don't think about the schools in the same way. The, um, the Parmeter people did want a long-term lease. I'm sorry Ted Wilson isn't here, but he's, oh he is here. Hi, Ted. <laughs> but he is very interested in, the, the, his organization is interested in buying that beautiful building. So I'd like you to think about the arguments that we've brought up tonight and think about how we can keep these institutions in town. Um, I don't often agree with Mr. Berger, but tonight I do because we're not trying to get top dollar. The reason that these substitute motions talk about an educational use is we're looking at schools that have been part of our our town for a very long time. If we were looking for more money, we'd be talking to housing developers. We're not. We want to keep the same tenants that we have. And that has been the Board of Selectmen's desire since last year when you all got up and said that that's what you wanted. We like these tenants. They've taken great care. The Crosby School is a beautiful old building. The Dearborn Academy has done wonderful work in that building. They've made it work for their students. They, they serve a very valuable um, function, not just for our Arlington people, but for the surrounding students that need the special needs that they accomplish. They have one of the most wonderful shop, um, shop places to do shop that I've ever seen in my life. And um, I think that they, what we need to do is not just think about the Board of Selectmen and our power grabbing, but let's think about the tenants. No, well, this is, there has been sort of a theme um, during this town meeting of distrust of the selectmen. Please, with this one, think about the tenants that we have. We really like them. We wanna keep them yet as tenants um, I'm hoping maybe somebody will get up and ask Ted Wilson if he'd come and address this meeting. But I think this is a very different um, situation. 
So I urge you to think carefully about um, demanding that this tenant go for a long-term lease because they may not want to do that. I don't believe they want to do that. They might. Um, obviously, it would be great to have both options, but we really want to keep them. Um, they have been a wonderful neighbor. They really, really worked hard. They've reached out to the neighborhood. And um, so I urge you to really think this time very seriously about the substitute motion. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Any notices of reconsideration? Notices of reconsideration? Okay, do I have a second on the motion to adjourn? All in favor of adjournment? We are coming back Monday. Monday night. All in favor? Yeah. Opposed? We'll see you Monday. <laughs>